Why do the producers of real estate reality shows want us to think that in order to be a successful real estate agent, you need an ozempic prescription, a personality disorder, and a complete lack of a gag reflex? Now listen, this is a female-dominated industry, but the average age is 55. And whether you're a middle-aged female or not, you're probably not blowing your clients for listings like some of these girls on these shows, right? Uh, Listen, I can't speak for all you hookers, but for myself, I'd love to see a little bit more of a middle ground between the quiverful couples slapping shiplap on every square inch of a house and the Adderall addicted ex bottle girls bitch slapping each other over listings from tech bros. Can we get a little bit more reality in our reality TV? All right, I'm so excited to be here today with my friend Nishad Khan, attorney at law, real estate attorney extraordinary. We used to share some building space together back in the day. That's right. Um, and I know we've done so many things together at the Realtor Association. Um, weren't you chair of the, um, the what, which committee were you chair? The Grievance Committee. The Grievance Committee. Okay, yes, that's uh, such an important one. It is, it is. <laughs> But you don't want to end up there if you're on my... <laughs> you definitely don't want to end up. If you're on my side of the equation. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are Excellent. you? I'm doing good. So congratulations. I know you have a new space over here in Orlando on Ivanhoe Boulevard. I do. Thank Such you so much. Such a great much. neighborhood. It is. It's beautiful. Yeah. The, the lake is right in front of us. So that's nice. Right in the heart of Orlando. I am so surprised. I love that you knew what I was talking about because I was, I was figuring, you know, maybe the ladies would know. But I love that you're up on the trending topics. So the scandal happening on Vanderpump Rules right now. For anybody that's watching or listening and isn't familiar, Vanderpump Rules, it's a really big show on Bravo. And there's two castmates, right? Tom and Ariana. They have been in a relationship for, I think, nine or 10 years. They purchased a beautiful $2 million modern farmhouse home in Valley Village in California. And now Tom is cheating on her with her, uh, I think, 10 years younger castmate. So that kind of got me thinking because there was a clip on the show where um, Ariana was talking to Lisa Vanderpump and she was describing, well, Tom took out a home equity loan, but it's only going to affect his side of the equity. And of course, Lisa, you know, Lisa very astutely said that, you know, when they re when they repossess a house, when they foreclose on a house, they don't take half the house. So obviously a home equity line would have been something that she would have signed off on. And when they sell the house, you know, if they don't, it's going to come out of her proceeds as well. But now that he's cheated on her and they're not married and, and on the show they talk about that they don't want to be married they don't want to have kids they don't want to be married um they felt like them purchasing properties together was sort of their version of marriage if you're somebody in that scenario like i'm somebody i, I don't really want to be married right so if i have a partner and i want to purchase a house like what would you recommend to people that don't want to be married but they want to start a life together like tom and ariana so that if something happens in the future they're prepared to part ways. Okay, so first off, congratulations on this. Thank this you. This is great. Thanks. I've known Christina for a while now, and it's uh, I'm impressed to see how well you've done, and and I think this is a great idea. So great Thank job you. on this. I owe you. I owe you some money for that. <laughs> no, not a problem. Um, <laughs> after after the show. Okay. So so regarding the Vanderpump rule, I know it's a reality show, but it definitely is reality. Uh, I I see that quite often where I have people come into my office and. Uh, they just fell in love, get swept off their feet, and now they're thinking of buying a house together. Uh, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, partner, partner, fiance, whatever it is. And I look them straight in the eye and tell them, this is probably the worst decision of your life because I have seen the other side of it, which is, you know, getting the call from the ex-girlfriend who now lives in California trying to get a loan in her name, but she can't because her debt to income is too high because of the house that she bought with her ex-boyfriend in Orlando, who is now living in the property with his parents and his new girlfriend and her children. This is a problem. And the only way to resolve this problem is, is through something called a partition action, which for those of you who don't know what that means, it means a lot of money paid to attorneys. It's essentially a lawsuit where you're going through a divorce for property. Uh, and it can get very ugly at times because a lot of times you're not fighting over the property, but you're fighting over who fixed the AC and who's been oh, paying right. rent. Yeah. Um, and so for those situations, what I always recommend is first figure out how you want to hold title. Because in the state of Florida, when you're dealing with non-married people, there's only two ways you can own property. One is called tenants in common, 
The other is called joint tenants with right of survivorship. And when I think of property or when I describe property, I describe it as a pie. Mm -hmm. And if you own a property or a piece of pie as tenants in common, that means, you know, if you and I owed it together, you would own 50% and I would own 50%. And once I give you 50% of that pie, you can do whatever you want with it. You can, you know, give it to your family, you can put it in your will, you can sell it. And I can do whatever I want for my 50%. The other way is joint tenants with right of survivorship. And what that means is we own the entire pie together. Something happens to me, it goes to you. Mm-hmm. Something happens to you, it goes to me. Gotcha. You know, a lot of people don't think about this. They're submitting a contract, they put their names on it, and they don't really think about how to own things. Mm-hmm. And they, uh, a lot of people look at property as a car. I just want to add someone a title. But it right. doesn't really work that way. You're not adding someone to title. You're giving them a piece of the pie. Right. Which means they own it and they can do what they want with it. That's a great point. So the second option is maybe like if somebody is a couple and, you know, they want to set it up where um, if one of them passes away, then their partner isn't going to be removed from the house by their or forced to sell their interest, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So what it means is we own this together. If something happens to me, it goes to you. The problem is, is you have to have that specific language Mm. in the deed. It has to say joint tenants with right of survivorship. If it doesn't say those specific words under Florida law, it doesn't work. You know, many people do deeds on their own. Mm -hmm. Many people write up contracts without thinking these things and it causes all sorts of issues. Yeah. But if you're not gonna do it that way and you're gonna say, no, we're gonna own a Mm 50-50 as tenants in common, then I always recommend to have something called a tenants in common agreement, which is basically a contract between the people who own the pie. Smart. And whether it's partners or maybe, you know, a lot of times you'll have real estate agents who will find the property, investors who back them up and they own the property together. Right. Even with them, there should be some sort of contract that says, if there's a disagreement, then we agree to sell the property and split the proceeds. If there's a disagreement, then one party has the option to buy the other party out. If there's a disagreement, then we can refer it to a third party who decides what to do with it. Without that kind of instruction, you leave it to the courts. Right. And so, you know, that's where people find themselves, okay, I bought this house with a partner, things were good, we got swept off our feet, but we fell on our ass, and now we have to figure out what to do with this property. The only way to handle it is going through a partition action. I mean, I agree. I think that's the most important thing that you can do is whatever it is, especially when you're dealing with any type of real property or contracts, which of course, you know, you're going to be the expert on all the legal side of that, but you want to spell it out. Don't leave anything to chance. Don't leave anything up to just crossing your fingers and hoping that it ends up well, because, you know, you never know. It's just- You never know. And then when it comes to real estate, a lot of people just assume the law will take care of it. And it doesn't work that way. It's whatever's in the contract, whatever's written- Uh, As lawyers, we have this concept known as the four corners Mm -hmm. of the document. If it's not in the document, it doesn't apply. Do you have any stories that you could tell us about that or any situations? Wow, yeah, I mean, we have many stories. So I have someone who I'm talking to right now uh, was was dating a woman and uh, she lived in the house with him Mm -hmm. and she moved all the way from the Northeast to live in the house with him. The house is only in his name. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then of course, things went, you know, hit a bump in the road and they broke up. So he moved out and now she's in the house Mm -hmm. and he wants to sell the house because he needs the money, but she's claiming, nope, you can't sell it. I have rights in the house as well. She's claiming adverse possession. She's claiming all sorts of things. And so, you know, again, if there is no clear understanding as to what the arrangement is going into the deal, Mm -hmm. then it's very hard to enforce an understanding later on right? Because it's not in writing. We're not a common law state, right? Common law marriage? We are not, no. In the state of Florida, either you're single Mm -hmm. or you're married. Okay. So there's no concept of common law uh, or, you know, separation doesn't even exist. Right. And I get that all the time where people are saying, oh, I'm helping a party find a house that's going through a divorce. Oh, I know. When it comes to real estate, you can't really go through a divorce. Either you're married or you're divorced because there's this concept known as homestead, which gives your spouse you know, uh, legal rights in your primary residence automatically. That becomes a problem because you have a lot of people coming from New York where Mm -hmm. they do have common law marriages and separations. Right. So they come down here, buy houses, thinking they're only buying it in their name and they end up adding their spouse 50% to that property. Yeah. All right. So we were talking about another thing, uh, not on Bravo, but on Netflix. So the Watcher House. 
So I think we were saying, I can't remember the state. I want to say what, like up north, Connecticut New or New Jersey? Okay. So you're familiar. So this is where these people moved into this beautiful house. It's their dream house. And then all of a sudden they get all these letters and it's like, we're watching you. I saw your daughter painting in her room at 9 a.m. I'm going to continue to watch you. And that always brings up the conversation with stigmatized property. So what what are your thoughts on that? If the previous owners, because I think it was revealed that the previous owners got some sort of letter. If the previous owner was receiving letters like this, saying, hey, we're watching you, <laughs> you know, do they need to disclose that? Does that qualify as a stigmatized property? What does somebody disclose in that situation? Right. So let's let's talk about whether there is even a requirement to disclose. Many people sign an as-is contract um, if you're a seller and you think that you don't have to say anything because it's as-is. And uh, that was true until a case in the 80s called Johnson v. Davis that basically said this concept of caveat emptor, buyer mm -hmm. beware, doesn't exist for residential properties. Mm -hmm. In a residential property situation, the seller has a duty, an obligation to disclose any material defects that are not readily observable by the buyer right. that affect the value of the property. Right. So the question becomes, the fact that the house is haunted, is that a material defect? Mm -hmm. Does it affect the value of the property? Right. Um, is it something that the buyer would know about? Mm -hmm. And the most important requirement is that the seller had to know about it. So if the seller knew that the property was haunted and this is affecting the seller's ability to sell because no one wants to buy it, and it's not readily observable to a buyer that there aren't ghosts running around or, or whatever right. if it is haunted, you know, maybe, maybe someone from out of state, Right. then the buyer may have an argument here in Florida that the, the seller violated their duty to disclose. In this case where they're getting letters, like if somebody's just getting letters, is that something that they should they should probably go ahead and just mention? So it's let's, not a let's material, put it this way. Is it a material defect? Would you buy a house where you knew the seller was getting letters from some I random would, person? I wouldn't that like that. Haunted? You wouldn't like it. I would very much would not like that. Would it affect the amount that you would pay for that house? Yeah. By several thousands of dollars? For myself, yeah, I would probably pass. There's your answer. Yeah. It's a defect, right? Yeah. If if you have to ask your question, if I knew, would I pay the exact same amount that I paid? Right. And if I didn't, if I wouldn't, and the seller hid it from me, then there could be a, a breach of their duty. What about if there was a, a site where, you know, let's say there was a murder or a suicide? At that point, is that considered it's the same thing would apply, right? That's a good question. So you would think it would, but under Florida law, there are exceptions if the site is a, uh, where well, there was a murder or a suicide or homicide, in that situation, there is no duty to disclose. Right, okay. Um, it also applies if the owner of the property had HIV, there is no duty to disclose. Now, right. the difference between the two is you can't flat out lie. If a buyer said, sure. you know, was someone killed in this house? You have to say yes. Yeah. You have to say yes. Yeah. When it comes to, you know, did the owner of this house house of HIV, mm -hmm. there's no requirement to disclose, and that's for public health laws as well. Sure. Interestingly enough, this duty to disclose because of a subsequent case, case also passes on to the agent. So right. if the agent is aware of something about the property, right. then they also have to disclose to the buyer. Mm -hmm. And this to me has been a very hot topic in the past few years. Really? Okay. Because you had a lot of buyers coming in, mm -hmm. buying property sight unseen. Yeah. Sellers were selling properties, you know, making tons of money off of it. Yeah. And no one was saying anything. And so now buyers are coming in and I get these calls a lot where someone bought a house. There were all sorts of issues in the house, whether yeah. it's mold, mildew, or termites, and the seller never told them. Yeah. And the first question is, well, did the seller know? Well, they must have known. How could they have not known? Right. Well, everyone has parents that own a property that they've never gone to the attic, right? Yeah. They don't, they only... They only stay in one room of the house, so there's yeah. a chance that they may not have known. Right. And if the seller does not have knowledge of the problem, and it's something that the buyer discovers after they close, then the seller has no duty to disclose. I'm on the TikTok, as the kids like to say, uh, and there there's some influencers there, and there's a couple, and anyways, they came down. Long story short, they bought a house in Tampa. Um, they've uploaded a, a numerous videos and photos um, detailing that it had extensive you know, rat droppings, roaches. I think they had a German inf roach infestation. They had rat droppings everywhere. Um, initially, I thought that they had not seen it. I thought they had bought the house site unseen. But later in a video, they detailed that they did come down and they saw it. 
But a couple of things happened. Um, and, and initially, unfortunately, they went right to blaming their agent. They're like, I the mistake that I made is I used the inspector that my agent recommended, which is why, of course, when I uh, am working with buyers, I always try to recommend multiple um, inspectors. I, I want to be a resource, but I let them know this is your choice. You don't have to use anybody that I recommend. Just if you're from Idaho, you may not know the best inspectors in Florida. Of course. Here's some options. So initially, your complaint was, well, the realtor picked the inspector, and so they're working together. And you know, of course, in the business, we know nobody that's a licensed realtor held to, especially a realtor and not a real estate agent. Uh, if you're in the realtor group, you know, you're not going to risk your license for a single sale for really any number of sales. It's it's not worth it. It's our livelihood. But that was her initial thought. Oh, well, they're working together. They're trying to screw me over. They just want to make a sale. But it turns out she did come down and view the property, but the, I guess there were renters maybe that were in the property. It was either the sellers or the renters and they wouldn't leave. And then the other problem was, um, I guess there were certain areas, and we see this all the time in the inspections, you know, not everybody cleans their garage out. So there were numerous areas that they couldn't inspect. And ultimately their inspector did note, you know, presence of roaches, presence of, you know, rat droppings. And they said they were advised, oh, it's Florida, it's not that big of a deal. But their big gripe was, okay, these people didn't leave for the inspection. And so, you know, there's been, she's got a lot of followers. And I did see one day she posted the real estate um, agent's information online. And I actually called to just say, are you guys okay? I know you guys, this isn't your fault. I mean, who knows? I wasn't there, right? I don't know how it was handled. But they're like, we, you know, their Google dropped to like one star, their phone lines shut down. Eventually she took it down. But, uh, you know, if you're if you're a home buyer and you're purchasing and the sellers or the renters won't leave, I mean, I always say, you know, if you're not comfortable with that, then come back when they can leave. I mean, what would you say to somebody that that they they end up purchasing a house they don't see these issues initially, and then they have like you know a really bad rat or roach infestation. I mean, is there anything else that you would have suggested that this buyer do, or what does she do when she's in that situation? You have a fifth. Usually in these contracts, you have a fifteen day inspection period, which can be changed to do whatever inspections you need to. And if the buyer decided to move forward with the closing, um, you know, without doing the inspections that they desire to do, mm -hmm. there's a concept known of doctrine of merger, which mm -hmm. basically says once you close, the contract and the deed merge into one, and right. that's the end of it. In that sense, it does become a buyer's risk where if the seller says, hey, there's roaches in there, mm -hmm. uh, I'm letting you know, right. you have a right to inspect. Right. Uh, the seller also has to obviously disclose to the tenant in the property. If the buyer still decides to move forward and close, mm -hmm. they've kind of accepted it. Yeah. And it's hard to go back. Now, of course, you know, they can point fingers and that's usually what happens is the agent gets blamed because the agent's the person who's putting the transaction together. Right, right. And you provided some wonderful tips in avoiding that kind of blame by giving them multiple suggestions and not right. just giving them one inspector. And to me, that's really what an agent should be doing is providing that kind of information. But ultimately, the buyer signed the contract, the buyer decided to close. Yeah. It's their responsibility unless the seller failed to disclose something. Then you get into the weeds because how do you prove that the seller knew, you know, there could be one roach. It doesn't mean that there's an infestation. Right. I mean, my pest guy delightfully told me that they squeeze in under these, it's disgusting, but they can get in, they're gonna get in. You just gotta have pest control. But yeah, I think that's it, right? You've gotta, if you don't feel comfortable and if you see roaches, get a pest control person in there. If they're not gonna leave, Stop the inspection and say, I don't feel comfortable. I want you to allow me to inspect all of the areas. Because once you're closed, you're kind of you're kind of in there. And then you're just trying to point fingers and prove something that may be unprovable. Yeah, it's hard to go back once you've closed. So yeah. really all the investigations should be done before you close. Well, listen, I, I know you've got a very busy schedule. Thank you so much. Not you, a Nishad's uh, an angel because I have this beautiful new car that I just bought and I got a nail in my tire. And so I pushed our schedule back a little bit. Thank you so much for um, accommodating and coming in and talking about the scan of all. Before I let you go, what would you say if if somebody's in that situation, if they're a couple, would you say just don't buy property together if you're not going to get married? Wh what would you advise? I would advise them to get that to agreement. have an understanding of what's going to happen if for some reason things don't work out 
And you know, not even you wouldn't even have to phrase it that way. If we ever have to sell the property, correct, we should have an agreement or an understanding as to right. how that's going to work. Yeah, and that's something that can be drafted by an attorney, mm -hmm. recorded and on public records. Yeah. It's there forever, and so there's no dispute later on. Thank you so much for coming in, Nishan. This was great. I appreciate it. I just wanna, I just wanna pop, 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 pop.